Et bonjour et bienvenue. I'm Jacqueline Wallace. I'll be the chair of this panel this afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. I know it's a glorious rainy day and we love to be in our PJs watching movies. So it's really nice to see your faces here. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists. Um, this is the panel on civility and theater making. Um, so I'm going to introduce each panelist as they come to present. And so first up, um, we have Becky Bowl and Megan Johnson. Uh, so Becky is a first year PhD student in York University's Department of Theater and Performance Studies. Her research explores autobiographical theater creation by cognitively diverse artists as a demonstration of self-advocacy and community activism. In addition to her academic work, Becky also teaches a multi-arts program for cognitively, cognitively diverse teens and adults in North Toronto. Megan Johnson is a performance scholar, arts administrator, singer, and dramaturge based in Toronto. She has a background in voice and musicology and is currently a PhD student in the Theatre and Performance Studies Department at York University. Her doctoral research centered on disability performance, infrastructural politics, and inclusive dramaturgy, explores how the creation practice of disability identified performers in catalog dialogue with the notions of disability justice. So please welcome Becky and Megan. And this is Megan speaking. We also have two access copies. If anyone would like one to follow along as we speak, just raise your hand and I'll give them out now. Uh, that's held at the University of Guelph. 
co-led by Dr. Carla Rice and Dr. Eliza Chandler, the Bodies in Translation Project, or BIT, is a shirk funded research project that aims to cultivate and bring scholarly attention to activist art, of which disability art is a major component. Alex's work as artist in residence during this year affords her the opportunity to explore issues, methods, and protocols related to how her practice connects to an aesthetic of disability art. Earlier this year, I was enlisted as an access research assistant to support Alex and the project as it unfolded. Alex quickly settled on that she was going to develop a verbatim theater piece that would be built around public perceptions of blind people on stage. So going out into various communities in Toronto, Alex planned to engage in dialogue with people on the street, querying whether they had ever seen a blind actor on stage, what sort of role they would imagine casting a blind actor in, and so on. And these conversations would be then audio recorded and act as the source material for the eventual Verbatim Theatre piece. So Alex was not able to be with us here today, but we have a short video clip of her describing the project, which we'll play now. Hi, my name is Alex Ballmer. I uh, am a writer, performer, director uh, in the performing arts, mostly theater. And um, I am, I suppose, the, the creative engine behind uh, Blind Woman in Search of a Narrative. Um, I really wanted to do something that worked with um, interdependence, which is very much, I think, a thematic core of all of my work. Um, and I was interested in the, the form of European verbatim theater, which basically um, uses uh, audio recordings and an earpiece. Um, actors listen to uh, interviews and literally verbatim um, recreate it on stage, but simply through the act of listening, and listening to it at the time of the performance. So the objective is to not only capture the content of what is being said in the interviews, but the vocality, the musicality of the voices that are being listened to. It seemed an absolutely perfect opportunity for um, blind <coughs> actors to, uh, to try uh, verbatim. So that was, that was sort of where the idea came from. And I I wanted to go out with a recording equipment, with recording equipment and with a support worker and ask people on the street um, to imagine me or imagine just a, a blind person as a character in a play or in a film and see whether or not people could get their head around that idea and if they could, um, what characters, what narratives would they sort of cast me in or or a blind person in? And it's always tricky when you're working in you know vague generalities of just you know any blind person. But I was curious to know if if the concept of being a performer, a, a, a blind performer in a in a, in a narrative, um, being uh, expressed by a blind actor and a character who's blind, just how well or not well people could relate to that idea. So, you know, that really has to do with representation. It also has to do with thinking about how stories are told and can you only imagine a story about someone losing their sight or a blind person that, <laughs> I don't know, falls down a hall, you know, as opposed to a story about a blind person who um, is a lawyer, or a blind person who um, is uh, leading a company, you know, any of those kind of film narratives, or a blind person playing Juliet. Um, so possibly not even um, not even a drama that is uh, necessarily written with blindness in mind. So it's really coming down to what happens when we imagine blind people on our stages, on our screens, and uh, uh, certainly in our audience as well. So this project currently- Hi, my name is Alex Bonk, uh, in the performing arts. 
This project, which is currently at its midway point, has also underscored an understanding of support that is frequently theorized in disability studies as a relational, reciprocal, and interdependent practice that weaves between intimacy and labor. Early on in this project, Alex and I discussed the myriad of ways that I would be offering support to her, physically guiding her to different locations in Toronto, providing technical assistance with recording equipment, and ensuring her safety against any environmental or social dangers. In supporting her artistic process, I would also be providing ad hoc dramaturgical feedback as the project unfolded, and in my role as a research assistant within the wider BIT project, helping to connect themes of the project to scholarly literature. However, soon after the project began, the framework of support that we had established shifted. Professional commitments emerged which required me to be traveling outside of Toronto for the first four months of the project. Enter Becky. As a friend and colleague, I enlisted her to share in the role of Access Research Assistant with me. We would each be supporting Alex at various points over the year, and Becky, in taking on the bulk of the work while I, during the months when I would be absent, would subsequently be supporting me. So even before this project really got underway, our trio was enacting a form of interdependent support, which, as Alex <coughs> mentioned, is a central focus in all of her artistic work. Short people stop ones. Okay. The support relationship that Alex and I engaged in during our research outings for this project was truly interdependent. For example, despite my status as a sighted person, Alex has spent many more years living in Toronto than I had, and still had a strong visual memory for the city. There were moments when I would describe the surroundings to Alex, and she knew, better than I did at times, which direction we had to go in in order to reach our destination. Reflecting upon this, we laughed, imagining passersby witnessing a sighted person asking a woman with sunglasses and a cane which direction they should be going in. Truly, our work together gave each of us an opportunity to support one another. At the time that this project was beginning, Alex was relearning how to use her cane, something that she hadn't engaged with on an ongoing basis since she had left the UK and moved back to Toronto. In order to safely and successfully navigate her new neighborhood, Alex took up mobility lessons from a Toronto-based company called Balance for Blind Adults, working with a mobility instructor who taught her how to safely travel to and navigate various parts of Toronto, including subway stations, and how to safely get on and off buses and streetcars. Alex's increased comfort with her cane allowed us to travel to various locations around Toronto in a way that was comfortable and safe for her. It is worth acknowledging that access support providing is not something that can exist in a vacuum. While our role for this project is to provide access support to Alex and being able to conduct interviews and generate this new piece of work in a safe and supportive way, there are other tasks of support that, while seemingly unrelated, are necessary in order for us to achieve our scheduled tasks for the day. These moments of support could be as simple as joining Alex on a walk with her guide dog, confirming that she was wearing the correct t-shirt for the project, searching for sunglasses, or doing a last check for wallet, phone, and transit pass. While these are tasks that Megan and I would not have to think twice about, offering support for these basic personal tasks ensured that Alex could feel comfortable and ready to embark on that day's outing. It is worth exploring these relationships of support with the realization that there are a number of daily tasks that need to happen before one can get out of the door, a number of daily to-dos that must be checked off the list before the art making can take place. While this project is still ongoing, we'd like to share with you an audio clip from one of the on-the-street interviews that Alex and I embarked on. The majority of the interviews this summer took place around Toronto's Summer Works Festival, specifically the Theatre Centre venue, which is at Queen Street West in Lisburg, set the stage for how the interviews were conducted. Alex and I would often set up on a street corner near the venue, but far enough away as to not be confused for a performance. I was set up with headphones and a Zoom mic so that I would be able to record the conversations that would take place with those that we approached on the street. We'll play for you now one example of how these interviews went. As I invite you to listen, please keep in mind that these interviews were taking place on a busy street corner, so you may hear at times construction or cars passing by. Prior to what you'll hear, Alex and I stopped a couple on the street and asked if we could chat with them. Alex had just asked if they attend theater when we turned the reporter on. Uh, I don't go that often, no. No? Oh, wow, yeah. OK. 
Okay, not for a while. Have you ever been to theater? I've been to uh, Stratford, yes. that kind of theater. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, I've okay. actually been there a while ago. That was fun. But uh, okay. since then, nothing really else in the okay. city. Um, so, at, at Stratford, mm -hmm. whatever you've seen there, have you seen a, uh, how many times have you seen a blind actor? Oh, God. Never, yeah. Never? Never. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. Did you imagine a blind actor playing? No, it's true. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. What? Would it be like a particular kind of player? Could they just play any character? Any character. Yeah. It's like, it's like what? <laughs> any character. Any character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like Blind Juliet. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be nice. I'd love to see that. I agree. Yeah. Okay. I, I won't make you late for dinner. I have one last sure. request. If one of you would, would be in a little scene with me, I just have one line of dialogue that I'll give you and then I'll respond to it and that'll just be our little scene. But, um, it would be between. It doesn't matter. It could be either which one of you would like to, to say the line. Okay. Easy. Okay. 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 So you pick a line. Yes. And what we'll do is we'll just kind of, I'll just get you to think about why, what, what, why you might be saying that to me. What would our relationship be? What's your character? What's my character? What's happened? Heavy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Should I read it or wait? Uh, tell me what you think this, the situation is. It was probably a relationship um, that went bad. And then now after time you realize why it went bad and you feel badly that it went bad. That's what I'd say. You feel badly or I, I feel, feel badly? You feel badly yeah. that it went bad. Yeah. So we had a, any, any particular kind of relationship? Be friends? No, more than that. It's like a Lovers, dating, yeah. Dating. I think, I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for this, that's what it sounds like, yeah. Okay. Okay? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> we just happen to meet on the street here. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you you know, it's your chance. Okay. It's your chance. Okay. 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 Okay.
Further, as she imagines the completed work to take the, fo the form of headphone verbatim theater, in which actors are fed their lines through an earpiece, she is already conceptualizing the piece as one that is structurally formed by a sense of interdependence. As non-disabled allies, Meg and I are excited to have a supportive role in this project. It is a continual process of being attuned to how, to how so much of support providing is often navigated through trial and error, working in a constant state of learning and relearning best practices, and adapting to what Alex's needs with the specific contents of this context of this project are. Once again, this project is still in its early stages. In coming months, we will be expanding our conversations to engage with members of the blind community around these topics. Alex will then be transforming these ideas and this collected material into a short verbatim piece, and we look forward to where this project is headed. Thank you. Thank you, Becky, <laughs> Megan, and also thank you to Alex. So now I'm going to welcome uh, Drea Flynn. Drea is a theater creator and academic. Currently, she is finishing her MA at the University of Ottawa, studying disability representation within the normative mainstream theater. Artistically, she wears the many hats as a playwright, dramaturge, stage, stage manager, director, and actor. She believes in collaborative process and engages with theater and academics with a strong belief that both can help shape our society to become more equitable. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I also have some access copies, but I will also be reading my paper as displayed behind me. So if anyone would like a copy, you can raise your hand or wave. Yeah. I decided to present my paper this way, partially because I was inspired by Jessica Watkins uh, from her CTR presentation um, last uh, June, I think it was, um, and just about doing something that feeds you and works for your uh, access needs, and so it's really helpful for me when I can see what someone else is saying, so hence why I'm doing it this way. Uh, the title of the paper is Shifting What Disability Means on Stage. And then of course it doesn't work. Okay. All right. There is an assumption in mainstream normative theater that the ability of the disabled body does not exist or is not commensurate to the performance of their non-disabled counterparts. This is premised upon our understanding of how we train actors, the audience's expectations, and their trained responses uh, to the viewing of a disabled body on stage. This training is rooted in the socio-cultural expectations that are ingrained within us about what it means to be disabled and what disability therefore implies. In this paper, we will examine very briefly some of the semiotic principles that are rooted within formal training pedagogy and reception of actor performances within our society. I will use Jerry Wolczewski and his examination of the semiotic modes that are applicable to acting and actor training. He identifies that this is a neglected area of semiotic theory. However, in my examination of his text, it will become clear that it is founded on ableist assumptions of what bodies are and are not allowed to do, who is and should not be on stage, and what these bodies mean within the theatrical framework. This being said, he does offer us an important path to examine how actors prepare for the stage and generate meaning on stage. The examination of performance in this essay is limited to physical disability on and off stage. Therefore, when I state disability here, I am referring to the visible physical disability 
other disabilities may be represented in the semiotic mean. However, the nuances of invisible disabilities need further examination. Still see it that way? Yes. All right. I think this will work. So, of course, I didn't rehearse enough. So, <laughs> so uh, given that sociocultural interpretation is learned, I suggest that through an integrated that though an integrated model of actor training is important, shifting our collective normative culture from an ableist understanding about disability there must be a willingness within the normative cultures to shift their practices. This will aid in the creation of more of an inclusive and more realistic understanding of what disability means and the potential aesthetic that can be generated from these new encounters. Semiotics is the process by which we can determine meanings from communications. Bertrand states that, open quote, the particular work is neither consistent nor universal, close quote. Open quote, it is produced by cultures and it is productive of culture. As meanings come into being, they change cultures, however subtly, and they change the way in which future meanings can be produced and read, close quote. In disability and performance studies, we understand that bodies contain meaning, and this meaning is defined by the system where those in power generate and define the meanings of all people. Understanding the pervasive power dynamics that exist in normative society today helps provide a framework within which to investigate disabled, bod uh, disabled actors on stage and the potential means that they can generate to, for their audiences. Wolczorski states that acting is both part of a semiotic system and also operates within its own semiotic framework. He investigates the actor's personal semiotic framework and determines that actors create signs through what he terms three features of acting. Uh, distinctiveness, air quotes, and the breakup and building up, air quotes, of the actor's body and the creation of the character's body, and the, air quotes, consistency within this process. We can agree, I think, with Wolczewski that acting is a representation of beings with an intended purpose to communicate those meanings. Here, representational performance, the performance that tries to replicate or represent a reality that reflects on and challenges and or confirms the audience's lived experience will be explored. By examining the realism of representational performance, we can determine how Wolczewski's semiotic framework can apply to our audiences that witness disabled bodies on stage in normative theater. The audience's personal context within the society and community that they are part of influences by how signifiers and signified meanings are interpreted and form the meaning of the performance. Actors and their characters operate within these systems, which the audience can then interpret as either mirroring their own personal reality, confirming their personal reality, or challenging the personal reality of the society in which they live. Wolczewski highlights that this ending defines the action, that endings define the action, the behavior and the intended meaning that the actor is trying to communicate. However obvious it may seem, the material of the acting is dependent upon the actor's body and its abilities, training, emotional capacity, and communication of their intended meaning up until the conclusion of the action. Wolczewski highlights that the audience will inevitably view the actor as a human being first, and then see the signs that the actor is portraying for them to interpret and then attribute features to the character. He stresses, however, that this actor's it is the actor's job to transform themselves so that only the intended meaning of the character's body is communicated to the audience. This informs our understanding of the play, the character, and the meaning. The actor's body is both, open quote, a sign and a non-sign, since it includes their own physical qualities independently of whether or not they are intentional, whether they are meant to signify something, or whether they are simply there because they cannot eliminate or conceal them without sacrificing one or more of the virtual components that are indispensable of their performance in the particular case concerned, but they all appear to the audience as charged with meaning. 
Because audiences understand their own everyday life experience, the perception of reality on stage also operates on the same level as the audience in everyday interpretation of meanings. Therefore, the actor's body and their work is, quote, the object of the spectator's direct intuition or empathy, close quote. The audience's general perception of people within their real world interaction might, Ropchowski states, notice a, quote, few details, close quote, which limits their interpretation of the person they encounter on the street. However, the theater audience is able to view the actor's body for a longer period of time and determine more specific details about that person and therefore speculate to a greater degree upon the character the actor is portraying. Disability, of course, complicates this understanding. As many disability scholars have noted, a disability is, in and of itself, performative in everyday life. For example, you, example, Carrie Sandel notes John Falso's commentary about entering a bus in a wheel, as a wheelchair user and the performative qualities and the audience reception that he receives when he gets on the bus. It is safe to say that when non-disabled people encounter disabled people in the real world, they first encounter the visible impairment of the disabled individual and not the person. This is what Falso is commenting on as he enters the bus and the audience or patrons on the bus witness his grand entrance due to the accommodations of the unfolding of the ramp, the sounds it makes, the space it requires, and the conversation that ends up happening when he enters the bus. Which is interesting when we look at Wotowski's semiotic functioning of acting, is that it highlights that actor training affects the way that actors prepare their characters for the audience's reception. I would further posit that actor training frames the way that theater practitioners, university institutions, theater, and inevitably the audiences are trained to interpret those meanings from bodies. This process greatly influences what is and is not intentional versus unintentional meaning, and therefore how bodies that differ from normative non-disabled bodies can be understood within stereotypical and reductive meanings. Carrie Sandel discusses actor training in North America in the tyranny of neutral. She is concerned with the psychological realism and highlights two areas of investigation, the neutral and the emotional body. She highlights how the psychological realism and the inspired acting techniques that were fostered in this process necessitate the actor's body to disappear within their character's presented form. This, necessita this necessity localizes the disabled body as unable to successfully act because it has established rules of disappearance. Because the disabled body cannot disappear within the respective character roles, this is also used to exclude disabled actors from being cast in disabled roles. Implicit, sorry, quote, implicit in the various manifestations of the neutral metaphor is the assumption that a character cannot be built from a position of physical difference. The appropriate actor's body for any character, even a character that is literally disabled or some Symbolically struggling is not only the able body, but also extraordinary and able body. Sandel stresses that this technique can reinforce physical stereotypes because of the assumption that inner feelings are directly relatable to physical presences. Because these stereotypical understandings of disability, open quote, such as fear and pity, close quote, are pervasive within our culture, the stories we tell one another through dramatic discourse and in the construction of our acting techniques that we teach actors, these misunderstandings and flattening of the disabled experience are perpetuated. Actor training reduces the plethora of bodies that, we, that live in our society to one particular type of body and therefore conflates the meanings of real lived experiences of those that differ from non-disabled bodies. We can then appreciate how the actor training of, open quote, the breaking down and building up, close quote, of characters from the function of making the actor disappear within their role is a priority within the normative semiotic system, and that this can be a precarious semiotic device of evaluating acting success and reception. Voltowski highlights how certain elements of bodies can produce meaning, such as stiffness in the body, a continual hand gesture, how eyes convey expressions that signify specific meanings to an audience. This specific meaning is predictable because audiences are predisposed to interpret certain meanings from these differences based upon pervasive stereotypes within normative culture. Therefore, these differences can be readable, for example, as pitiful, fearful, or heroic. 
This meaning generated is so strong within our normative culture that the audience is automatically and subconsciously processed this information and assimilates it within their interpretation of the character's figure and stage action. This then leads us to Wolczewski's final feature of acting, which is consistency. The functional feature of consistency is to determine how constant the truth is within the presented piece. The believability of character and the story is shaped by the success of the actor to consistently transform themselves and convey the attributes of the character as realistic. Wolczewski highlights how audiences can interpret intentional and unintentional acts as realistic or part of the fictional reality. He determines that an actor playing the disabled character open quote, runs the risk, close quote, of having the audience interpret their character's impairment as the actor's personal impairment. And therefore, because of the lack of transcendence, the actor will have failed in their job to disappear within the character. Wolczewski highlights the assumption of the normative audience's reception of disabled figures on stage. He states that the non-disabled actor playing the disabled part must demonstrate their acting ability and highlight their difference between the character and themselves so that the audience does not mistake the transformative quality of the work the actor is doing. This highlights that audiences are more likely to determine a disability as or that they are portraying their personal lived experience authentically. This links to David Proud's circle of disability. He proposes four stacked circles to be representative of the elements that an actor should consider when preparing their character for performance. The first circle, which is at the center of the four overlapping circles is the actor's self and their embodied knowledge of their own disability. The second circle is the character's disability. The third circle is any other characterizations of that character. And finally, that of the performance that is being portrayed. I would like to take these four circles and apply them to the audience's reception of disabled actors and the characters on stage. This relates to the audience's understanding of authenticity of the experience versus the reality presented on stage and challenges the interpreted fiction of the reality within the play. Proud posits that acting is a series of masks that an actor puts on, that disability is just one of those masks that are available. I argue that because, as Patrick Cupper suggests and many other scholars, that disability is itself performative within everyday life, disabled people already have to put on a mask in public that ultimately is informed by and or conforms to and or confirms the stereotypical expectations of society and of perceived impairment. In theater performances where disabled actors have been included in casting of disabled characters, it can be seen that audiences interpret the dis disabled characters of disability as the actor's disability. Proud highlights that disabled actors cannot air quotes, lose their disability, it is always present. However, you can disguise your disability within a character's disability. He states that it is possible for disabled actors to portray characters who are more physically disabled or impaired than themselves, and that this provides an opportunity for disabled actors to, therefore disabled actors can create a hybrid disability, disabled character that may have some disabled actors' physical characteristics as well as the intended disabled character's attributes and impairments. This hybridity happens when the disabled actor combines or accentuates their own physical impairments in service of their character that they are portraying on stage. The perception by the audience of the disabled character is indeed influenced by their understanding of the ability that the actor brings to the role. This is highlighted through a comparison of critics' reviews of Brad Turner's play, Kill Me Now, where the three productions cast a non-disabled actor to play the disabled character of Joey. Most of the critics praised the non-disabled actor's prowess for the ability to portray a disabled character. This conforms to the well-understood celebrity and Oscar worthiness of disabled performances. When we compare this to the 2017 co-production by the Royal MTC and NAC, where the character of Joey was cast with a disabled actor, the critical reception tended towards an assumption that the actor and the character shared the same impairment. In doing so, the critic erased the disabled character's disability and replaced it with the disabled actor's disability. When this assumption happens, it violates Wilczewski's three semiotic requirements because the fiction has been replaced by reality. 
or at least the perception of reality's authenticity, and therefore the audience is no longer transported to a unified fictional world. Wolchowski highlights that if the audience is no longer able to interpret the performance as fictional, but instead interprets what transpires on stage as reality, the performance loses its transformational aesthetic and becomes reality. It is clear that audiences, when presented with disabled bodies, can be more often than not interpreted as disabled actors' bodies and their characters as the same, and therefore not appreciate the transformational and potential semiotic meaning that disabled actors and their bodies can create. Carrie Sandel comments that she realized during her academic training that her impairments, her impairment was generating meaning because based on the roles that she was offered. She cites an instance during rehearsal when her director wanted her to cross the stage slowly as the old beggar man. When she disclosed that this was not comfortable for her body and made her feel precarious, the director encouraged her that this was part of the characterization that they wanted to have projected. Sandal recalls the audience's stare and she internalized their pity for her as the performer and not the character. Here we can clearly determine that the audience has had moved from the transformational fictional reality to be removed from the internal semiotic system. In doing so, Sandal's body was a sign of an authentic presentation of conformed normative understandings of the pitiful disabled person in society. When we discuss the structure of semiotics and Sandal's actor training as it affects disability, meaning production, and disabled people, we are engaging with the material from the normative system within their own framework. Due to accessibility laws, institutional spaces are obliged to accommodate disabled people within their structures. However, accommodation, if only done to allow disabled people within the spaces and not shift spaces, will inevitably continue to confirm stereotypical understandings of disability's potential meaning and generative quality. I believe in order to create a real change in the systems of power, the system must not just make space within their walls, but allow disability to shift, roll, dismantle, and reinterpret elements that do not integrate all people within the, this generative form. Disability and impairment always signify something. What this signifies, however, is culturally determined. It is important for us to shift understandings of what it means to be disabled within our society and then reimagine the aesthetic potential of a non-neutral, physically diverse actor cohort that can challenge representational perspectives of what disability means within lived experiences. That's the end of my current thought. Thank you.
Rena is driven by a vision of full inclusion and integration of disability both on and off Canadian stages. Living with two chronic diseases presently in remission, Rena is committed to authentically reflecting the values and diversity of, dis of the disability community throughout Real Wheels activities and culture. Welcome, Rena. Thanks, Jackie. And thanks all of you for hanging in there uh, this afternoon. And thanks very much to my fellow panelists, Gray, I need a copy of that. We are, we are actually uh, developing a curriculum to train actors with disabilities at Real Wheels. And so we've been grappling with a lot of the concepts that you were discussing, um, particularly around the neutral body. And we recently had a focus group uh, with the community, with the multidisciplinary team, and multi, um, and uh, we were asking for feedback. This isn't my presentation, I'm adding this on. We were asking for feedback around the curriculum that we developed to date. And we received um, feedback saying, one, that we should do our very best to, uh, to design uh, to apply universal design uh, practices to our curriculum so no one individual student would ever be isolated or separated from the group. And the other piece of feedback is that we should apply the rigors of a traditional acting curriculum as much as possible. So it's, it's, we're dealing with complex, uh, complex stuff. And, and diversity, of course, it exists within the disability community as it does within any community. So 16% of Canadians self-identify as living with a disability. I'm so used to making that statement that when a colleague just sent me the latest stats can result from 2017, it's actually 22% of Canadians self-identify today as living with a disability, but obviously we're not seeing that demographic reflected on our stages. That's more than one in five. And that fundamentally is what guides and drives the work that we do at Real Wheels. Well, first and foremost, we're a theater company, and in many ways a traditional theater company, but by necessity, a lot of our work involves mitigating and eliminating the barriers that prevent us from fulfilling our mandate. Our mandate, as Jackie said, and I'll repeat one time, is to produce performances that deepen audiences' understanding of the disability experience, and we tell stories in which disability isn't the focus, but rather forms the landscape against which universal issues are explored on stage or debated on stage. We're very much an integrated company, and from our beginnings during the first seven years of the company existence, from 2003 to 2010, our founding artistic director, who's pictured here, James Saunders, he lives with Quadriplegia, he created new work in collaboration with two able-bodied artists. We know disability isn't binary, like a simple on-off, that most of us exist somewhere along the spectrum. And we're, we're all challenged on some level. And one way that we define the human experience is by how we manage those challenges and how we optimize as a broader community to ensure that everyone has the same opportunities. A little history to anchor us. Uh, the company's first show, Skydive, was developed over three years. It was conceived one night over beer, of course. And uh, one of the actors threw out the question, what if an actor, instead of entering stage right or left, what if the actor dropped out of the sky? The other catalyst, and it's a little more pragmatic, uh, was that James, in contrast to the other two artists, he wasn't getting work after graduating from theater school. He had an accident midway through theater school. He'd really had to fight to continue. In fact, he had to adapt all of the acting exercises to his own needs and experiences. Um, he did get the occasional audition, but only when disability form formed part of the narrative. So never for a character who wasn't living with disability. Of course, this is, this is in the early 2000s. And he realized that he was going to have to create his own artistic opportunities. So Skydive concerns the relationship between two brothers. It's a 30-second skydive, um, told in an expanded 90 minutes. And what was wildly innovative about this production is that both characters fly, they hang upside down, they spin, they fall, they stand, they sit. They appear anywhere in 3D on the, the stage, in the stage space, and that's thanks to choreographic equipment that was invented by Sven Johansson, to which the actors are harnessed, and which, thanks to lighting effects, is completely invisible to the audience. There's an image of Bob Fraser in flight. In the final scene, one of the characters enters in a wheelchair to deliver the final monologue, the closing monologue. And then in the closing, in the, in the, rather in the curtain call, the actor remains in the wheelchair. And members of the audience, of course, were wondering why. And the reason is because that actor, that same actor they just witnessed flying and spinning, he lives with quadriplegia. 
So in a sense, skydive rendered disability invisible. And that was partly the point. The disability was made invisible so the person could be seen. And that's going back about 11, 12 years ago. And at the time, audience exit surveys confirmed that skydive was having impact on their perception of disability. It went on to a successful Cross Canada tour. It was actually here at the Centaur at one point. And Real World, with its very first production, established a national reputation for innovative work. And I can take absolutely no credit for any of that. So this is great. That's about uh, a little over 10 years ago. And back then, simply having James on stage, that was sufficient. That was enough. Audiences had not been exposed to an actor who uses a wheelchair in real life. And simply by virtue of James playing the lead in our productions, we're refulfilling our mandate of changing perceptions. Now we fast forward to 2016. Here's an image of our poster for Creeps. We mounted the first fully integrated production of David Freeman's award-winning 1971 gritty masterpiece, Creeps. Freeman lived with cerebral palsy, and Creeps tells the story of four men with CP who work at a sheltered workshop, or what's what it used to euphemistically be called. Uh, ours was the first production in the play's 45-year history that featured an integrated or mixed ability cast. We had three actors with disabilities working alongside four able-bodied actors. But we did things like we adjusted our rehearsal schedule. We worked four hours a day over a longer duration. And of course, that benefited all of the artists, not only those who needed shorter days for stamina reasons. Everybody benefits from <coughs> disability-based accommodation. We see that time and time again. Creeps was a very successful show in many respects. It was recognized by the Jesse Richardson Professional Theater Awards. It won uh, three awards. I think it was nominated for five. It included you know, outstanding production and outstanding artistic achievement. But, and in contrast to a previous year, in which, which James was invited to accept an award at the Jesse's, and he was lifted up in his wheelchair to the stage because there was no access. He was lifted, was not safe, was quite dangerous. A couple of guys lifted him into the stage so he could accept an award. Um, the Jesse's committee, for the first time, installed a ramp to the stage. God is blessed. This is now a <laughs> 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 Eventually. So I, you have to excuse the producer and me has to plug our next big show. So this season we're premiering a new play, and there's other reasons why I want to share that with you. But this play is inspired by the true story that has happened to somebody in our community of the inexplicable recovery from paraplegia by a Vancouver-based um, teacher and dancer who was a wheelchair user for 13 years. This is a story that baffles the medical scientific community. It arouses a lot of conflicting emotions in the disability community, and it's celebrated by the religious community to which faith belongs. The cast is, will be comprised of actors with disabilities, with able-bodied actors. The lead is going to be played by Emily Brooks. She's an actor who lives with quadriplegia. This is her first professional role. We first met her when she participated in one of our community projects that I'll talk about a little bit later. And as the title suggests, the play is more about belief systems not about disability. Disability does form the landscape against which we're exploring faith, fundamentalist faith, atheism, <coughs> SBNR, is that a, a spiritual but not religious? That's a West Coast term, but I think you've probably heard it here, and concepts of healing. And the production is also going to explore mixed stability or integrated wheelchair dance as a means of storytelling. And so we'll be developing part of our storytelling vocabulary through uh, through the use of dance. Wheelchair dance is gorgeous, and if you're in Vancouver this April, please join us. So what happened between then, our first production of Skydive, and more recently? Because today our shows reflect a much wider spectrum of disability, which input not just from performing artists, as I mentioned, but a range of artists and backstage workers with disabilities. So two things happened. One of the key changes is our engagement with community. In 2011, under the banner Real Voices, we began offering experiences and training in the performing arts to people who live with disability. Sometimes these are process-oriented, and sometimes these culminate in a big production. Real Voices has become a vital part of what we do. I tend to refer to it now with our professional projects as inhaling and exhaling. The image here um, of participants in our very first Real Voices, which we ran out of the gym at GF Strong, that's BC's largest rehab facility, 
and demand was such that we were going to offer 12 weeks of programming, we ended up offering 23. And since then, we've mounted seven more Wheel Voices projects. These are all various posters. Note the one in the center from Sexy Voices, a burlesque theater cabaret, exploring sexuality from a disability perspective. Sexy Voices, has Alexis Chacoin, who was also on our board, was created and produced in response to community demand to reclaim an identity that was felt to be denied. PhD student who's done a, a in disability students, uh, disability studies, Teresa Milbrock from the University of Missouri. Uh, she wrote about it this way. She said, Sexy Voices presented not only the invitation, but the insistence that audience members stare, a demand that challenges the idea that disabled bodies are only supposed to be stared at in a medical context, not in the performance of sexuality. Many of the performers who sang, danced, and stripped on our show did, did so in adaptive ways that were designed to work while seated in a wheelchair, and the performers, of course, had complete control over how much they would wheel. Our article will be published in the liter uh, Journal of Literary, Literary and Cultural Disability Studies next year. So through our community projects, more and more talent is emerging. Here's Andrew, he's a comic genius. Here he's the <coughs> MC in Sexy Voices. Uh, his first exposure to the performing arts was through Wheel Voices. He's been in every single one. And after working with us, Andrew began performing comedy in clubs around Vancouver. He's currently making a film about his romantic escapades with another one of our community participants, a talented videographer. He's organizing fundraisers, and it was Andrew's idea for us to produce Comedy on Wheels. This was written and performed by a cast of 17 with a rich variety of disabilities, plus a four-piece band, three of whom are uh, persons with disabilities video projections and featuring a professional comic that we brought in from the UK. Uh, we flew her into Vancouver, we integrated into her into the show in the final 10 days. One of the things that was also cool about this show is that we really practiced and we received a grant to be able to do this. One of our, the earlier uh, panelists spoke about the challenge of, of raising, <coughs> raising funds. Um, we received a grant that enabled us to practice radical accessibility. We hired a personal care attendant to ensure participants' needs were met, including nutritional and toileting needs during production week. We offered shuttle service to and from the venue, facilitating accessibility for everybody. We translated our play playbills into Braille. We created a venue map of the theater, which provided information about how to access the venue, walking and wheelchair routes, and a detailed description of the show's plot, plot points for those who prefer or require <coughs> visual support aids. We offered ASL interpretation and audio description for patrons at all the performances. Here's Art Jonker and Amy Amante in Comedy on Wheels. They're performing a little song and dance musical parody on the hierarchy of disability called Anything You Can't Do, I Can't Do That. <laughs> Amy had studied acting in her youth. In her 20s, she became blind. She assumed her performing arts career was over. Cut to 12 years later. Amy learns about our Wheel Voices programming. She joins Comedy on Wheels. Um, by the way, just a side note to this image. Note the floor has a colored pattern. It was there to help uh, performers to navigate their way across the stage. And here's Amy again the following se season. She's carrying into a microscope. Here she's performing a lead role in our professional production of Aaron Lacra's sequence. And she's portraying a professor with a different form of sight loss than her own. This is the first time that the role is played by an actor who lives with disability. So Real Wheels has progressed from working with one individual artist who lives with disability, our wonderful and brilliant founder, James Saunders, to a substantial community of individuals. And by opening ourselves to be guided by diverse perspectives, our work has grown, and our impact is not only on audience perceptions of disability, but on artists with disability. And today, more than ever, we're all about providing a theater platform that nurtures artists, that offers diverse representation, and that impacts perceptions. So I mentioned earlier, a bit of a digression, that part of our work at Real Wheels involves addressing some of the barriers that mitigate against us being able to fulfill our mandate. And one such obstacle is the limited number of performance venues in Vancouver that are truly or fully accessible. And even newer theater venues often don't meet the needs of people with disabilities because they don't take into account the needs of performers with disabilities, and they lack accessible backstage areas both for performers and backstage workers with disabilities. So three years ago, in partnership with a fellow disability arts organization, Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture, we began looking into this. And what sets our project apart were two factors. One, 
we work with a multidisability audit team. Um, so we used to say multidisciplinary. Multidisability audit team, a manual wheelchair user, a power wheelchair user, someone who's blind, someone who's with vision loss, someone who's deaf. And we considered accessibility not just from the perspective of patrons with disabilities, but also performing artists and backstage workers. So during phase one, we developed an audit tool which allows any theater owner or operator or company to conduct a self audit on their venue. That's the name of the fire hall. It's a heritage site, 110 years old. We conducted an audit and found some solutions there. And then during phase two, we refined the audit tool. We tested it by applying it to three venues and then one of the venues, this one, the Roundhouse Arts and Recreation Center, was selected to receive a detailed architectural concept development for accessibility enhancements. This report is influencing next stage planning of actual accessibility enhancements at the Roundhouse. Also, the two other theaters on which we conducted audits gain knowledge that will contribute to any accessibility enhancements that they undertake, and that one is planning major renovations and prioritizing accessibility. So this project is not only influencing them to pro prioritize accessibility, it's also providing them with valuable tools. And our report has been used by the City of Vancouver Facilities Department, and we've been informed it's also influencing the work taking place on a new private development, which is all great, except the city should be doing this work. So originally, Real Wheels was providing a vehicle for James way back when. James wouldn't even have gone to theater school had he had his accident earlier. <coughs> But he was a trained theater artist, and so our focus early on was on creating productions for one brilliant actor with disability and on impacting audiences' perceptions by doing so. And we were doing that. We were successful in doing that. But we then reached out to the larger community to re-energize ourselves. And what we experienced was an incredible mutual exchange of energy and excitement. Our community projects now are their ends unto themselves, as well as a gold mine of incredible talent that we're hoping to, to further develop and we're providing opportunities to in our professional productions. So the more we do, the more we grow, and the more it also points to some of the limitations, such as the lack of accessibility. For more than one in five people, we still have a lot of work to do. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, but I'd like to show just a couple of very short videos of our community work and sexy voices and calling me on wheels if I may. Sexy voices. Thing I want coming out of my house. Can you imagine? 
you have a bad day, you just got done picking up with like your loser ex-boyfriend and your cat's like, I'm my own asshole on the regular. But even I found that disgusting. <laughs> they were in fact disabled. I thought that was stunning. I tried to think of the metaphor of what that uh, generated in me. I'm not quite there yet, but I feel there's something very critical about that, that sort of uh, imposing an invisibility of disability. Oh, you're, you're referencing Skydive, I think, or yes. the, very, the very first production. Because yes. I think, you know, today we really, we really look at disability as um, a source of vitality and dynamism and originality and, and creativity and patience and you know so many extraordinary qualities. We actually did one of our the community projects was called Super Voices and it was about some of those startling, amazing qualities that are associated with people with disabilities. So yeah, I think a few years ago we needed to do that kind of a show that made the made the disability um, invisible. Um, and I, I think we're moving. It's part of our trajectory, right? So we're moving into uh, a different direction now. Yeah. But thanks. But back to that, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, reaction of the art of the artists themselves, how it felt to be able yeah. or to feel not disabled, not disabilitized. Are there any other questions? I have about 500 million questions. This is scary. Thank you so much for the panel. Um, I wanted to ask the first presenters, and I, I really liked how you were conceptualizing interdependence. And um, I wanted to hear more about the dramaturgical supports and how those dovetailed with the access supports, because a lot of times the service is at least in the US, it's very much about you don't mix that. That's a paid position, it's professionalized, but it's supposed to be, there's supposed to be a boundary between that and other types of support. And it just got me thinking about what it means to reconfigure power relations when they're not separate and how, whether it influenced the content of your dramaturgy as well as the form. Um, so Megan actually had to run and catch a flight, talk about interdependence and shifting support again. She keeps doing this to me. Um, so I can't speak too much. A dramaturgy hasn't really played a big role formally yet in this project. Um, but in terms of how we're navigating this relationship, it's totally complicated and there has been weird shifts in power. 
Um, you know, I kind of hold Alex's life in my hands a lot of the time, more literally than I'm comfortable with at times. Um, but, you know, and also like we're personal friends. So, and Megan and I have talked about when, you know, when we're being paid for a project, when are we friends offering support and when are we paid support workers and the dynamic um, of power and how that shifts and can you really turn that on and off is something that we've kind of been thinking a lot about. Um, but yeah, kind of as the project starts coming together, the draft structure will work, will be really interesting and I hope we get the chance to reflect on that. So okay. thank you. I think we have another question over here. Do you have a question? Sir? I have a question with the, uh, the company. Uh, sorry, I forgot the name. Something dry. Uh, and all the companies. Uh, do you have anything for Telecraft? You people, how you will introduce new people? Anybody who wants to join our community projects is but welcome how? to come and participate. How? Um, just uh, we ask for people to register through our, our website or by phoning us. Um, and we promote through a Facebook page largely and through our website and, and other things. But we are Vancouver based, we're not national based. Are you, are you in, where are you from? I mean, do you have any campaigns? I mean, people, who, I mean, the, so, I mean, the society, do you have any campaigns in Vancouver? I mean, if, you, if, if anybody go to the Googling, they are found your website. but. My question, do you have any campaign in the society? Um, can you define campaign for me? Like other organizations who are working for the disabled people. You know, in yeah, Vancouver, yeah. there is a lot of organizations working for disabled peoples. So do you have campaign with them? We, like advocacy campaign, something like that, or a talent right. hunting? We don't have, we don't specifically do, do talent hunting, but there are several other companies in Vancouver um, that are working with members of the disability community or individuals with disability. Uh, we have, in addition to Real World, we have Theater Terrific. Um, we have All Body Stands. We have Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture. So there's there's a number. So Vancouver is actually um, is is quite rich in that in that regard. We still have a long way to go. Thank you. Okay, Ash is going to give us an announcement, I think. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and for all of our panelists. It's just really terrific. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Ash speaking. Um, so I just want to let everyone know um, that we're going to take a 10-minute break. We're going to come back here for our last and really exciting um, session.